Good morning. Hi, Elena. Hi, Tippy. All right. For those of you that are still yakking, stop it. Chop liver up here. You know, I've thought so many times, like, we need some sort of a gong or something that we need to have up here to get everybody riled up, reined back in. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you so much for the way that you have provided for this wonderful church. Thank you for worship. Thank you that we get to be present and as a group, as a family, sing to you uh, because you are worthy, and it is that song, By Grace Alone, absolutely, everything that we have, we're on this planet by grace alone, and we travel this road by grace alone, and our sins are forgiven, and our future is secure, and all of it is simply because you decided it would be so. Before the foundation of the world, you decided that would be so, and so God, we just owe everything to you. Lord, I just pray as, as we talk about your word here in Exodus 18, and what takes place in a conversation between one of the greatest leaders who's ever lived and his father-in-law, Jethro. I just pray, Lord, that you would bless our time, bless our thoughts, the way that we think about this, humble us before your word and teach us all exactly what we need to hear individually because all of us have our own struggle in this way. So, God, we dedicate our time to you. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So yeah, this morning, maybe you could kind of, sort of, consider today's message somewhat of a state of the church address. We do state of the church, state of the church addresses every once in a while, maybe once, sometimes twice a year, whatever. But to be honest with you, you all know how the church is doing right now. I mean, in in October, we uh, had our campaign for India, Nepal, and other things that we give to, and we gave a kind of, sort of, a semi-update on how the church is doing Brian said, I think at that point, the state of the union is strong, right? You might have remembered that. And so I don't want to talk a ton about the state of the church. I just want to talk about, I, I picked this message though, or this, this uh, passage of scripture so that I can talk about the one thing that I do want to talk about when it comes to the state of the church. Yeah, it's really, really strong. We've seen several people got saved last year. We had many baptisms. Our giving is up. You guys have been so generous. It just keeps going up. We're so incredibly blessed by that. India and Nepal is doing better than it's ever done before. Not only that, but we are doing this Renew Ministry expansion, and that is going amazing. Um, There's even more things that are surprising. I won't go into details, but there's more things that just keep popping up of how this is working. We're in with other churches, and we're doing ministry with all kinds of people outside of our church. So the state of the union is very strong. We're doing great. And I just want to express to you why it's strong, okay? And that's out of this passage. The reason why we're doing so good here as a church is because we obey this passage. We obey the advice that Jethro gives to Moses, which is teach and delegate. And when you do that, it creates a strong group. It creates a unifying experience where people uh, the way that they operate together, not just in a church. It can be a church, it can be a nation, it can be your family. But when you teach and delegate in the right way, if you're teaching the right things and delegating the right things to the right people, then oh my goodness, it's gonna create an, an amazing, strong environment for everybody. And so that's what I wanna talk about this morning. Um, so what I wanna do, my, my primary point, is that God does this with us. God teaches a person in order to delegate to them. Why God does this, I don't understand, but he has decided, I don't fully understand, I understand quite a bit, and I'm going to show you, but why he decides, no, human beings are going to be the way, the primary way, human beings, us, sinful, falling apart people, we're going to be the ones primarily how God works on planet earth and expresses his love to others. So this morning, I want to look at this this story, interesting story out of the book of Exodus. You're going to be reading this, Exodus 18, on February 6th. So Tuesday this week is when you're actually going to be reading this passage, but many of us have gotten pretty close to it. You'll understand some of the background. For those of us that are working ahead, who's working ahead? Anybody? Some are. Somebody already, I, I knew it, Holly. I knew. Okay. 
Which, by the way, <laughs> Jessica, I need you to go into my office and grab my Bible off my desk. <laughs> she has hers. No, I need you to go into my office and grab mine. See, I am literally giving a message about how a leader leads well by example. And look at me. I'm a wreck. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to be in Exodus 18, so if you faithful ones who brought your Bibles with you, you may turn to that. We'll be in there, we'll be there in, in, a, in a bit. But I just want to express something that, that's difficult for us because it's really hard for us to wrap our minds around how different we are today as a culture, how different we are in our understanding of who God is than these people that we're going to hear about. Thank you, my dear. Very nice. We love you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So, Exodus, the time of the Exodus, radically different than our understanding of the world today. It's weird how that culture must have been, how little they understood about God. It's really easy for us to judge them because we've got, you know, the the whole book right here. We've got everything. And not only do we have the entire book, we've got the last 2,000 years of the church studying this book and writing commentaries on this book and dissecting it and discerning it all kinds of wisdom. The amount of wisdom and understanding that we have about God is just mountains above what these people in the book of Exodus would have understood. If you remember um, from a few weeks ago, I talked to you guys about the dispensations. You remember this? Let me just give you a quick little reminder. You remember in uh, the book of Genesis, it started with free will at the very beginning. In the Garden of Eden, it started with free will. That was the first dispensation. Did Adam and Eve do well with that? No, they ruined it. It didn't go well. And God, because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which gave them conscience, and we enter into the second dispensation, which is conscience. And that went terrible over the next thousand years-ish. And it got, we got to the point right before the flood where their thoughts were only evil all the time. And so God wipes out the flood, ending the dispensation of conscience. And Noah, when he rested, when the ark rested, then he has a new understanding. God gives him further understanding about governmental type of things and the uh, corporate punishment, capital punishment becomes a thing. And so then nations start to rise, Tower of Babel, whatever. And it's still not going well and the nations are doing terrible. And so God calls Abraham out of one of the greatest nations. He says, we're going on a trip and I'm going to make promises to you. And we enter into the dispensation of promise. That goes on until now, okay? So we are about, in this story, we are about, we are on the cusp, we're right on the edge of moving from promise into law when the Ten Commandments are given and Moses gives the law. We are right before that. That's where we are in our story. And so um, it's just wild when you think about it, though, that Moses... And the people that are following him, they have zero understanding of the Ten Commandments. It's so foundational and elementary to us. But these people did not have, thou shalt not covet. They didn't have that. Thou shalt not even desire your neighbor's wife. They didn't, which it's mind-blowing to us, but it helps us understand and have a little more grace for the likes of Abraham, right? Right? and Isaac, and Jacob, and all the ways in which they just royally screwed up that just seems like, duh, to us, they didn't have even the Ten Commandments yet. So that's where we're at in our story. So today, we are about to go from the dispensation of of promise into the dispensation of law. So February 6th, uh, Exodus 18 is where we're going to be, so you can make your way there. We're going to talk about Jethro's advice. My first point this morning is that a leader can only be good if he is humble. So, guys, what is the supreme virtue of Christianity? 
Humility, exactly. Thank you. You cannot have love, joy, peace, etc., unless you are humble. It doesn't exist without humility. Every single one of us should be growing in our humility. And Moses has this humility, and he's got it in spades. And why Moses has humility in spades is because it is needed. He has a job that is so hard. I've been thinking a lot about this 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 week, last few days. So hard. I would argue that Moses had the hardest leadership role of any human being ever to walk the planet in all of human history. Nobody has done what Moses had to do. Nobody's done anything like it to lead two million people for 40 years in a desert where you can't even grow your own food. Nobody's done that. Moses is the only one that's ever done that. And Moses was taught by God. (laughs) He was so taught by God and so known by God. And then God, after he has taught him all these things, he gave him the most difficult delegated leadership task that he's ever asked any mere human to do. You can't accomplish what Moses accomplished with pride. You can't accomplish it without unbelievable, amazing character. So when this takes place, Moses is roughly 80 years old. And he has been so taught by God, mainly by crushing, which that's what happens. Moses knows something. This is so interesting to me. I have thought and meditated on this so often. Moses murdered somebody. Right around the age of 40, Moses murdered somebody. And this is in the, the dispensation of, this is after the dispensation of, of uh, law, or excuse me, of, um, what's the thing? Promise. Before that, government. There you go. We know capital punishment. Moses knows life for life. He should know that what he deserves, he does know that what he deserves is death. And so he kills a man and he knows he deserves to die for that. And he flees for his life. And for some crazy reason, God decides, you're not going to be punished for this. I'm not going to treat you as your sins deserve. What an unbelievable, wonderful lesson for Moses to learn and understand that God is a God of love. God is a God who knows you intimately, and God is a God of mercy, and he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. So I just want to pause here for a second and just ask you, I want you to think about, okay, how has God done that with you experientially? What have you done? I'm sure we probably haven't murdered anybody, but what have you done where it's like, I cannot believe that somehow I have not been punished as I deserve with this. I just want you to think on that because everybody's had a different experience, maybe many things. It's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that God doesn't treat me as I deserve with that. I just want you to think on that for a second and just thank him. He is a God of mercy. That is how he treats us. He knows us so well and so intimately. But not only that, God taught Moses experientially through that, but also at the same time, he, uh, he has taught Moses a very hard gift as well, because Moses ended up spending 40 years in the desert. <laughs> Many of you are experiencing desert right now, but you know what God taught Moses in that desert was how I'm going to take care of you no matter what. No matter what, Moses, you're going to wander around in this desert basically alone. Sometimes you'll have family around, but I'm going to provide for you in this desert. Why God decided to just, so you're going to do this first, Moses. I'm going to prove it to you first so that when I'm done, when you're done with this 40 years, then you can lead all these other people out and show them how it's done. It was a gift. Moses could not have done what he did without God teaching him that incredibly hard lesson. God crushes us and then he shows his mercy to us and he gives us grace and he puts us through incredibly difficult things so that he can redeem it and turn it into something we could never possibly imagine. Can you just think? 
Did Moses expect any of that last 40 years of his life to be like that? No, not at all. And it wouldn't have been without everything that God had orchestrated ahead of time. God taught him and taught him and taught him and crushed him and taught him and crushed him and taught him until he said, okay, I see Moses is ready and now it's time. Now it's time for me to delegate. I need you to do my work, Moses. So that's where Moses is. That's the humility of the man. And yet now here in the context, I want you to understand this, that because you probably haven't read this yet, But this event with Jethro, this event takes place six weeks after the exodus from Egypt, okay? So imagine that. Six weeks ago, you're with with Moses and all the Israelites in the desert. And six weeks ago, I just saw God perform 10 plagues. I just saw God kill all the firstborns, but not mine because I was obedient. I just saw God part the, rock, the Red Sea and drown all of our enemies. And still to this day, he is leading us by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's what's going on. And over the last six, and the way that he's fed them and gave them, uh, quenched their thirst with water from a rock, all of that, that's all just happened. So Moses has been leading these people for six weeks He is a brand new leader, (laughs) very inexperienced. He's got virtually none. And now he's leading these 2 million people. And God has provided with all kinds of supernatural provision. And yet, you know, we, it's easy for us to get judged from our high horse. But you think about the, the Israelites, just more context of the people. We read about them and it's like, man, they are whiners and complainers. They just moan and moan and moan and moan and they just make things incredibly difficult for Moses, about as hard as as they could possibly make it for him. These are undeserving people. They seem to be short-sighted people, grumbly people. And we read it, you'll read about all their complaints and stuff, maybe a little bit this week and and some uh, this this coming week. But honestly, as I'm as I'm reading that, I was asking myself, where where are the faithful ones? Where were the people that were bringing some sensibility into the group? Where were the leaders that are encouraging people like, hey, don't forget what happened yesterday. Don't forget what happened the day before that. Don't forget what happened the week before that. And hey, why don't don't you just come with me? Just if I could encourage you, just come with me. Let's go sit by the pillar of, of cloud. Let's just sit here and watch it. And sit here while the sun goes down and let's watch it transform from a cloud to a pillar of fire. Like where where were the people that were like that? We don't see it in the the passages. The people that were just saying, hey, have, have faith. God is with us. He is for us. He's routing our enemies left and right. So it's easy for us to say, oh, they're just a bunch of whiners and complainers. But guys, where would we be? What would happen to us if we were in that situation? Here we are, Americans, just fat and happy. That's what we are. We're spoiled rotten. We got our air conditioning and our heating and our cars that we drive around and our jobs that are providing more than we need. Imagine if we took all of that away from absolutely everybody. We go into a desert and you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. Do you think you're better? I hope you are. But that's where they were. So Moses is leading, and I need you to understand this. He's leading roughly 2 million people. Do you realize what 2 million, that's a lot of people. Just put it in context. Cedar Rapids and the surrounding area. So you got Cedar Rapids, Hiawatha, Robbins, Marion, North Liberty, uh, yeah, Shueyville, those those towns around. If you take all of them, it's a little less than 200,000 people. Moses is leading a group 10 times that amount. Oh, and all of their animals. Sheep, cattle, bulls, all of that. It's just absolutely crazy, the amount that he's leading. So it's here, as all these people are acting this way, and Moses is so green as a leader, it's here at this moment that his father-in-law, Jethro, shows up. So who's Jethro? Who's this redneck priest guy? Sorry, Sorry, anybody named Jethro here? We good? I didn't mean to, okay, all right. 
It's not a common name, so all you pregnant mothers, you can choose that. Anyway, Jethro, <laughs> Jethro was a Midianite. Now, what's a Midianite? It says he was a priest, and there's, there's been some confusion about this. There's been some speculation about what this, what this guy was. Jethro was a priest because he wasn't an Israelite. So what we know is that in order to be a, an Israelite, you got to be a descendant of Jacob. Jacob was named Israel. You got to be a son of his, a descendant of Jacob, in order to be an Israelite. So he's not. Jethro's a Midianite. Well, where did the Midianites come from? They came from Midian, a man named Midian. Now, who was Midian? He was the son of Keturah. Who was Keturah? Keturah was the wife that Abraham had after Sarah died. So it's entirely possible that this Jethro was a priest of Yahweh, not because he understood Yahweh from Jacob, but because he understood Yahweh from Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. Just something kind of interesting to know, but he just does prove here his amazing wisdom, and he does prove to be an amazing God worshiper. So, Moses, even though, and this is just interesting, proving his humility, even though Moses is the leader of two million people, as he greets Jethro, he bows down to him, and he kisses Jethro. Moses humbles himself before this redneck priest. He's the leader of two million people, and he bows and kisses. And Moses, I mean, it's just, he indeed was a humble man. Even though God was using Moses to do the craziest miracles, to stand up to the most powerful man on the planet, which was Pharaoh, and to win, proving Moses to be the most powerful man on the planet, even though Moses was that, he wasn't full of himself. The reason why is because God had spent the last 40 years of his life just crushing him and humbling him. So he bows down and he kisses his father-in-law. Is this how you treat your in-laws? I can ask most of your in-laws, so. So not only... Not only was he humble in that he greets this father-in-law of his who's of much lower status than him, but also Jethro rebukes him. Jethro tells him what's what. He gives him the business, and Moses accepts it. Proverbs 15.10, the one who hates to be corrected will die. Proverbs 12.1, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Whoever hates correction is stupid. <laughs> Moses wasn't stupid. He wasn't a dummy. He was humble. A man who is leading two million people listens to a man of much, much lower status and responsibility, and he places himself under the wisdom of, of that man. So I put myself in uh, Moses' shoes here. And to be honest with you, it kind of breaks my brain a little bit. Here's what's a little bonkers to me, and, and we'll, we'll read it in the text. If you've got your Bible, like I do, <laughs> let's go ahead and read the text. Exodus 18, we will start in verse 13. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening, when his father-in-law saw that Mo what Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone, why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. <laughs> you and these people, which by the way, that's some, that's some humility on Jethro's part to challenge Moses, the most powerful man on the planet, to just straight up say, Moses, this ain't good. That's speaking to, Je to Jethro's character. What you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. You're wearing yourself out, Moses, and you're wearing them out. It's too heavy for you. You can't handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. 
you must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him, but teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. Okay, we'll stop there. Guys, this is what breaks my brain, is that Moses was doing this by himself. Two million people, how could the leader of two million people not understand, hey, you should teach this stuff to people so that they can handle it on their own? They're gonna, of course it's going to wear them out. It's going to wear everybody out. This is so unsustainable. It is as sustainable as trying to tread water with a millstone tied around your neck. I mean, it just is absurd that he's trying to do this, and it seems so obvious to us, informed people. But guys, even leaders miss the obvious sometimes. But if they are humble, God will continue to teach them, and he'll continue to delegate more to them. So point number two, Moses' humility, okay, a good leader will not merely dictate, he will teach. So verse 20 says, teach them, where to go? Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. The advice is you got to teach them, dude. Stop. <laughs> Don't just give them a fish, Moses. You need to teach them to fish. If you're just sitting here deciding cases all day long, yeah, maybe Moses, you're growing in wisdom and understanding because your brain is wrestling with all these complexities all day long, but nobody else is growing in that. You aren't teaching them to make good decisions. You're making their decisions for them, which just means they will not be self-sufficient. All you're doing is changing your diapers, changing their diapers. <laughs> like what you need to do, Moses, is potty train them. It's going to be way better for you and them in the long run. So it's easy for us to look down on Moses here like, duh, man. But you know what else occurred to me while I was studying this? was that maybe, just maybe, we have the very first incident of preaching ever. Maybe. Off of that opinion. Have we had God's written word prior to this? No. Not that we know of. Not that we understand. Maybe there was some, but here we've got Moses. We are about to have God's written word, his written law, and we're going to have the first sermon, maybe, ever preached. It's interesting, teaching was maybe just not much of a thing back then, where you gather an, an, an assembly of people and bring forth God's word, it just, maybe this is new. So Jethro is saying, Moses, you got to teach this. You got to teach this to these people. And the next chapter, that's exactly what happens. The Ten Commandments are given and God's word is presented before the people of God. That's just interesting. In many ways, that could have been the very first sermon. So Moses decides he's going to teach. Ladies and gentlemen, um, preaching is a mystery. This is, it's just so strange and odd to me. For some reason, God decided that this would be, the preaching of God's word would be the primary way throughout all of human history how the world would understand the word of God. Why does he leave it to men, dumb old humans? To, I, don't, I don't understand <laughs> fully. If I were God, I wouldn't entrust my word to human beings. I wouldn't entrust it to me. So for some strange reason, God entrusts it to men to take his word and to spread it. And, and here we are in the year 2024. And I just wonder, often I think about this. I want to know everybody that had any kind of impact that put me where I am today. I want to know all of them. When I get to heaven, I hope that I get to meet everybody that had something to do with me getting saved. And I think about this with preachers, because preaching is so incredibly integral to what God has done on planet Earth. It's the primary way that people understand God. And I want to know, okay, what preacher in 1672... What preacher impacted some of my relatives? What preacher in 1849 or 1920 that impacted my family and, and relatives? Like, I, I get it, but I, I want to meet those men, you know? 
And of course, it's not just with preachers. I'm not trying to elevate preaching above anything like preachers are so deserving and everybody else is not. That, that's not at all what I'm doing. Of course, it's true. I also want to meet all the mothers that had an impact on me being here. All the school teachers and all the other relatives and friends that were encouragers to my family members to, to get me here. But just to talk about preaching for a second, it's so weighty and it's so humbling. I, I, Jethro told Moses, you got to teach, man. You got to stand before the assembly and get them all on the same page. And it just is, it's so humbling. I mean, I, I feel this every single week. Every week I feel like, who am I? How dare I stand here in front of God's beloved and utter a word? I know me. <laughs> Why? Again, I don't want to speak too much about this, but because preachers are not superior. That's not at all what I'm trying to say. That's not even in the same universe. I'm just saying this, this is a, a mystery. One of the biggest reasons that the world has not burned up in the last 5,000 years is because of preaching. Good, solid preaching. It is, the, it is the way in which, the primary way in which God has decided to make the church a lamp on a stand, the way in which he has made us salt to the earth and a city on a hill. It's the gathering of the assembly and the word of God being spoken and God chose it to be this way. And how dare anybody say, how, how dare any, any preacher stand before any crowd and say, I'm up for the task. I'm strong enough. They need to hear what I have to say. That's total arrogance. I don't want you to hear Ben Hunt. What a complete misrepresentation of the truth. No one's up to this task. No one is strong enough to bear that burden. And that's kind of the point. God is like, I am going to put the things of me, Moses, I'm going to put the things of me in your hands. The most significant thing for preachers, for preachers ever since Jesus died on the cross, the most significant thing the world will ever know, something infinitely bigger than every single one of us, the cross. I'm going to hand that to you, and I want you to show it to everybody, to the assembly. And of course, it's not just preachers that are tasked with that, showing the cross to the world. So Moses was taught by Jethro to teach. Teach God's word. He is taught to give the wisdom that he has to others instead of just fixing everything all by himself. What Moses needs to do is he needs to say no to the things that are unhealthy, and he needs to say yes to do something much more healthy instead. And every single one of us in this room has the ability to burn ourselves out doing really good things. Many of us have done that. We have utterly burned ourselves out doing really good things. My bet is that the majority of us, maybe in this room, small majority, big majority, I don't know. But I bet the majority of us are already sitting right on that ragged, eight, ragged edge. <laughs> We're all trying to maximize our impact, right? And in trying to maximize, we realize that our own health is at risk, Right? Even Jesus knew this. You realize that? Even Jesus knew his health's at risk if he doesn't take some time out. Jesus knew that he had to keep himself healthy. I mean, my goodness, if, if Jesus had to get away to a solitary place on a daily basis to decompress, to process his thoughts, to talk to his father, oh my, how much more we do we need to do that? And if we aren't doing that, if you aren't doing that, you are currently running yourself into the ground. You realize that? That's, what, that's the, the path you're on. Maybe you haven't hit rock bottom yet, but you are driving yourself in that direction. And guys, for us, why do we not say no? Why do we do too, too much, take on too much? What's the reason for that? 
why you don't say no to more things, why you wear yourself out saying yes to all these good things. Well, let me venture a guess. You want to know why you do that? I'll just, I'm not going to guess. I'm going to tell you why you do that. Fear, shame, and pride. That's it. The evil trifecta, fear, shame, and pride. You're afraid of what other people are going to think of you. You're afraid of the shameful thoughts that they're going to have for you. And so instead, in your pride, you say, I got this. I'll just keep performing. Fear, shame, and pride. That's why you wear yourself out. And so, instead of submitting to your own conscience, doing what you know you ought to do in your pride, "Ah, I got it. And there's something like that in all of us. And there was something like that with Moses. It's like, dude, I, the, he's, he's got all these people and they're all scared and they're all hungry and they're all thirsty and they're all hurting. And Moses is like, well, they're in, in, they, they are in desperate need of my leadership. There, there is no time for me to teach somebody else how to do it. I'm the only one that can provide this. I can't say no. That's what's going through potentially, probably through Moses' mind. So do you suppose that Jesus ever felt that way? These people are scared to death. Like, did Jesus think these thoughts? These people are scared to death. They're hungry, they're thirsty, they're hurting. Yes, of course he had those thoughts. And he literally had all the answers. He could heal them right there on the spot. He had all the authority. And yet, he had no problem saying no. Jesus said no all the time. Why did Jesus succeed in this without sin? Well, He didn't do the fear thing, and he didn't do the shame thing, and he didn't do the pride thing. So here's poor Moses, brand new, green, fresh leader with all of this stuff that no other leader on planet Earth has ever had to experience. And Jethro says, you need to say no to the people and teach them instead. Yes, God has granted you the wisdom and understanding. You need to teach them everything that you can. Pass it on to them so that they can live as peacefully as possible, having the wisdom of what to do when the peace has left. And not only do they have the understanding of how not to get in trouble, they then also understand how to fix it when they are in trouble, and they also understand how to fix others when others are getting in trouble. Lightening your load. And guys, I know that this seems obvious. Again, it seems, duh, Moses. But we do the same thing. How many of you in your parenting don't teach your kids very quickly? Huh? It's just too easy. I'll just do it myself, right? It's going to take way too long to teach them how to do it. So you, so you don't teach them how to clean up their toys, you do it instead, because in the moment, it's easier. Or you don't teach them to do the dishes, you do it for them, because it's easier in the moment. It's like, well, I don't have the extra five minutes to clearly articulate to them how to do this right, and if I have them do it, then I'm just going to have to undo it and then redo it, so just forget it. I'm just instead going to grumble about to myself about how irresponsible they are while I do what they should be doing, right? But guys, it is just much easier in the long run to potty train the kids instead of still changing all the diapers for your 30-year-old son still living in your basement. That's what happens when you don't teach. You relegate your kids or the people under you to a life where they don't launch. God does not do this to us. God does not want us staying the way we are. God fully intends to use every circumstance in our life so that we grow out of it. So we have to do the same thing. That's what Moses had to do. That's what we have to do. Teach. It's not okay for you to stay where you are. So, He grows us. This is what God does, and this is what we are tasked to do. He grows us through teaching and delegation. So point number three, a good leader won't only teach, he'll also delegate. So here's what he says, verses 21 through 24. Let's read that. Jethro says this to Moses. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, 
trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring very, every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God, as God so commands, you will be able to stand, withstand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. So verse 24, humble Moses listened to his father-in-law and he did everything that he said. So let's talk about delegation for a second. Jethro tells him exactly how to delegate. He says there's four things that are needed if you need to delegate something, four requirements for the person you're delegating to. One, they need to be capable. Two, they need to be honest. Three, they need to fear the Lord. And four, they need to hate dishonest gain. Like, can you imagine if every person who ever led you was described like that? (laughs) where they were capable, honest, fearing the Lord, and hated dishonest gain. If you could be led by those kind of people all the time, that would be great. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, here at New Life Community Church, we do things a little bit differently than most churches do. One thing that we are so careful to do is to choose the right men to delegate to. Leadership at New Life is always going to look like what Jethro described to the best of our ability, which is why we don't hire from the outside. We never do it. We haven't done it in 25 years, almost 30 years now. 30 year, 30 year anniversary is coming up, by the way. You can't know if a man is a qualified leader based on a few interviews and you know, watching, a, watching him do his job for a second. Churches that hire like that are just rolling the dice. And sometimes it works out for them and they find a really good guy, but it's a roll of the dice. Because all too often, they hire men based on their talent, not based on their character. And before you know it, that leader has really hurt people. And not only does that guy end up getting fired, but the church ends up on the brink of a split or closing its doors. This happens hundreds of times every single week. That's what happens. We disciple our people. We raise our people up and we delegate work to them based on knowing, not guessing, knowing that they are capable, honest, God-fearing, and that they hate dishonest gain. And the only way we can know this is if we know them, really know them. Not acquaintances, not even kind of, sort of, no, really know them. Not only do we know their character, but we know their strengths, their weaknesses, how they respond to correction, how they respond to fear, how they respond to false accusations. That's a fun thing to do, just falsely accuse somebody just to see how they respond. So over the last year and a half-ish, we have done some serious delegation to two men, Ben Gross and Matt Huther. Prior to delegating to these guys, we knew these men. We have known them for years deeply. We know and are certain of that they are capable honest, God-fearing, and they hate dishonest gain. But over the last year and a half, they have more than confirmed their qualifications in this area. They've they've exceeded the expectations. I'm so proud of how they did with the Renew Ministry expansion. Many of you were present at that training along with a bunch of people outside of New Life. And I I popped in. I I didn't even stick around for the training. I popped in at the beginning for a few minutes, and then a little bit later, I popped in for a little little more time just to check and see how things were going. And I was more than impressed, and so was everybody else. But I want to share something that's so sweet to me is that that was even possible. (laughs) That's what's so sweet to me. I knew that this was going to go great. I knew it. I didn't have any question about it. I knew I was not going to get any feedback that something was taught wrong or that things were confusing or that things were said that was contradictory to what's been taught before. I knew that wasn't going to. Now, of course, Ben and Matt, they're probably going to experience a little bit of nerves before their very first training with people outside of new life. I get that. But it's just how sweet that is that I experienced zero nerves about that. I just knew. I trusted them implicitly. This is going to be run right because I have spent thousands of hours with both of these men 
in all kinds of different situations, discussing family issues or marriage issues or ministry difficulties or really complex problems, and then on top of that, had an absolute blast with them in the Boundary Waters or Colorado or California, (laughs) hanging out together. Guys, there was not a single question in my mind as to how that training would go. And that's a testament to the men. It's the testament to our relationship. It's a testament to our theology around discipleship. We teach them, we know them, and then we delegate to them. Why? Because that is exactly what God does with us. God teaches a person in order to delegate to them. And you need to understand at the very heart of God is his desire to teach and delegate to us. Moses is not the only one that he taught and delegated to. Leaders are not the only ones that he teaches and delegates to. He wants to do that with every single one of us, and he's been wanting to do it since before the foundation of the world. God determined before the foundation of the world that he must die on the cross for sinful, rebellious people. These people would be completely undeserving of his love and affection, like Moses, full of sin, but I still choose him as an object of my mercy. Moses knew experientially that he was an object of mercy, and you, ladies and gentlemen, living in the next dispensation after law, you have an even clearer picture of God's love and grace, the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, the cross causes everything. The very reason that there is such a thing as teaching is not because of math or economics. No, the reason there's such a thing as teaching is the cross. The cross is the most significant teaching tool the world has ever known. The greatest piece of wisdom that a person can ever learn. It's a thing we teach on every single week. God didn't just make us robots so that we would automatically know him. No, he wants us to discover him and learn step by step as he teaches us. And he does that primarily through like our whole life. He does this crushingly teaching us. He uses our circumstances, our relationships, our hardships, our sin to slowly with great patience and grace teach us more and more about the significance of the cross. Our God is a teacher and he is a discipler and he desires for us to know in every single nook and cranny of our hearts the significance of the cross for every emotion we have, every thought we have, every sin that we commit, every shame, every fear that we experience. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, there is one thing and one thing alone that God longs for you to learn in this life, and it is the significance of the cross. Nothing is even in the same universe in comparison. And as we learn it, as we are crushed and then healed by such a ridiculous love, then we are delegated to embody that same ridiculous love. You don't just know it, you act on it. It's like God's saying, I chose the cross before the foundation of the world so that it would cause you to act like it and to act on it. So if you're here this morning and the thing you're feeling is not primarily God's grace and love for you, but instead you're feeling the crushing of your own life, the crushing force of the mistakes that you have made and you're here desperately trying to figure out why in the world Why in the world? What's underneath the crushing load that you're experiencing? What's underneath all this despair that you feel and the regret that you're experiencing in your life? Well, there is an answer to all of it. It's the cross. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your mistakes. You do not have to pay the penalty for your mistakes and everything that you regret. You can be loved by a God that so knows you far better than you know yourself and a God that desires to fill every spot in your heart with the understanding of his love and his grace and his forgiveness. 
A God that can take you from somebody that's just ignorant and selfish and full of regret to a person that embodies that forgiveness and love and grace and becomes a person that is not only healed by that, but you are now a person that heals others with it. You're taught it, he delegates it to you, and you act. If that's what you would like, then please don't leave here without talking to somebody. We'd love to welcome you to the family of God, put the resources in your hands to help you as you begin your journey with Jesus as your treasure. Why don't you go ahead and take a minute with somebody next to you. You can discuss or you can pray, jot down some ideas, and the band will close us in a song in a minute.